and in person from St. Mary, his beautiful parish in Jamaica. You know, I, I was looking around the world <coughs> and watching videos of Haiti, of, of uh, some of the other Caribbean and African uh, islands and, Cari and um, African countries. And I realized something. If you look at some of the places, you would, uh, you would, uh, you would know where you are if you were just dropped in the middle of one of the streets, <laughs> you, unless you heard the language. Maybe in the Dominican Republic, <coughs> you would hear a different language. In Haiti, you would hear a different language. But for the most part, just looking around, you wouldn't be able to tell where you were. And uh, it's really interesting to see. And uh, by the way, I'm not talking about something positive. I'm talking about something negative. I'm talking about the rundown nature of some of the neighborhoods, <coughs> the lack of infrastructure, the, the, the people and their um, expressions. You know, it, it is just so obvious that there is something consistently wrong. <laughs> this part of the world. Amen. But anyway, we know that God is God. <clears throat> now, I want to ask you to pray this morning. There's a friend of mine that I spoke with yesterday. I, I've been bombarded with all kinds of issues, <clears throat> some more life-threatening than others. We had, we had some folks that came um, for their chicken yesterday. You know, we were having a giveaway. Um, to our community of whole, not live, <laughs> but butchered chickens, um, so that they can have a, a good, you know, a, a good roast chicken or however they want to do it um, for Christmas dinner. And so one of my youngsters, a young man from the community, came by, and uh, I had told him about it last week. He said, come a couple days before Christmas, and you know, pick up your, uh, your gift from us. And so he came early yesterday morning because <laughs> I heard a voice outside calling, Pastor, Pastor. And so he said he came for his gift <laughs> anyway. But it wasn't here yet, so it came later. And he came back last week and he came back. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's, it's so, somebody said to me that these youngsters are, they are not to be trusted. That's a very euphemistic way of doing or saying it, that these young people are not to be trusted. But I wonder if we are not there for them. Uh, Sister Lorna, um, if we are not there, Lorna, Lorna um, Stanley, Lorna, you're over there in Trenchtown a lot of times, and <coughs> they look rough and they look tough. And, you know, I, I was talking with someone, you know, that, about them. I have been in some really serious communities. <laughs> some very talented trench down is one thing. I've been in um, communities in Dela Creek and, and you know and uh, you know Tavares Gardens. I, I've worked in the various Majesty Gardens in Kingston, if you know where I'm talking about. And uh, when I'm in those areas, <coughs> one of the things that always um, jumps out at me is how respectful a lot of, I won't say everyone, because, but I've not really experienced negative, uh, a negative response, but um, how when I go in, or when I'm in Ocho Rios, or when I'm in one of the communities around here, people that don't know me, you know, how they come and they, yes, father, yes, daddy, yes, yes, yes. <coughs> you know, uh, I'm driving on the road now, sometimes some curse because I don't drive fast enough. <laughs> but it was it's so interesting to see the, the respect that come out of these, they have their heads tied, but they call in your father and they are respectful. You know, they're, they're making way for you, so to speak. And, uh, and so, you know, they came yesterday for this, and so I gave them one. And it was just so pleasing to me to be here on behalf of our members, on behalf of our partners and our friends <coughs> that contribute 
you know, um, someone sent a donation yesterday um, from, I think he's in Florida. Someone sent a donation from Florida and said, Pastor, use this. And all of those things are used. We have right after Christmas, not at Christmas per se, but right after Christmas, a couple of days after, um, we are going to be having, a, you know, an event here for the kids. It won't be, you know, something for a whole bunch of kids to come together on. Can't do that right now, but but the kids are getting gifts. Their year will be crowned with showing them that somebody cares and is all because of you. And so I thank you so much for this year and your support and your dedication <coughs> and commitment to Acts Mission. Because without you, those kids wouldn't have a gift. Without you, those families may have not had, you know, something that would be a substantial meal. And uh, throughout the year, we've been able to do that. Financially support, support with school, and having the kids here, upstairs, you know, in classes. It's just really um, a blessing to be a part of the family of God, and you, having you as a part of our family. <coughs> this morning, though, um, I'm changing things a little bit. I'm not gonna use that, do that five minute session. Because what I need to talk about can be talked about in five minutes, unfortunately, or fortunately. And so, um, the, the design of a human being, the design of a man or a woman that has come to know God, and even if you have not come to know God, that was your basic design, um, we, we, we tend to, or we not tend to, but we have lost track of really who we are and what we are. <clears throat> and I want to, coming into the new year, or ending the old year, I want you to open your understanding to the power of the creation. You know, you hear me talk about that many times, about the new creation and the new creation realities. But the power of the creation, why are you the way you are? Why is it that you know, we, we have all of this mystery surrounding the inner man, the spirit that's on the inside? We have the mystery surrounding the soul of man. We have the mystery surrounding the body of man. <coughs> we have the salvation of the spirit, the progressive salvation you know, of the soul, and the renewal of the body you know, later on in our um, you know, in God's timing. And we, uh, we but, but although these things may be apparent to us on the surface, what does it really mean to us to have such knowledge in this physical flesh right now? <coughs> is, that, is it that we just know it and just go on and just live every day and walk around and talk and pray and, you know, do some nice things, give a chicken and, and so on? Or is it that God has given us this knowledge to empower us um, to be able to be powerful weapons against our adversary and his, powerful weapons against what the world has become, <coughs> excuse me, what the world has become because of the fall of the first Adam. And so we are, we are subduing, we are taking back, we are exercising control over things that are well, really out of kilter, you know. And, uh, but but what, what has been infused in us? What has been imparted to us? You know, and I'm not talking about even the fact that after we become Christians, we receive the Holy Spirit. But what is built into us? <clears throat> as, as a divine design. What has been built into us? You see, I have a vehicle here that's um, it's a, it's an Odyssey that's in the garage. And the Odyssey has, you know, there are cars that come with, uh, one time there was a car that came with a three-cylinder engine. You know, and then there's a car that comes with a four-cylinder engine. Mine comes with a six-cylinder engine. And when I press the gas pedal, you know, the accelerator, I mean, that thing just takes off. 
you know, sometimes I, <laughs> I'm on the road <coughs> and there's somebody I know that has a, you know, a smaller engine and they're trying to pass me or do something. And I hit that gas um, pedal, that accelerator, and I zoom so fast that I pass them. Don't tell anybody that I do that. <coughs> but, but it's built in. But there are people that will get into that same six-cylinder engine that has all that capacity and that power. You know, in Jamaica, they say, under the bonnet. Amen? They have all that power under the bonnet, you know, under the, 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 you know, the front of that car. And uh, when they do that, you know, they, it has it, but they don't use it. They, they, they never go over 40 or they never go over 50. You know, they don't hit, hit, hit that accelerator for, um, to achieve its greatest potential. No, we don't necessarily want to do that at this point, but um, I was in one of these Teslas in Ohio with a, a young man, a, a friend of ours at the time, <coughs> and uh, he took me for a ride in the Tesla, and, uh, and so uh, he took me on this, you know, long road, straight road, you know, nobody really was on that road at the time where he lived, and he hit not the gas pedal, but he hit the accelerator. Now, normally you hit the accelerator, you hear the engine rev. <coughs> you hear something. He hit whatever it was that was the accelerator in that vehicle. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, I shot back with G force, <laughs> but I didn't hear anything because built into the Tesla, or for that matter, built into the gasoline engine, is inherent. And built into you by God's design is power, <coughs> its ability, it's, it's, it's the ability to grasp the infinite, it's the ability to grasp the unseen realm, it's the ability to see beyond the natural things, it's the ability to move outside the realm of flesh and, you know, and, and walls and stone and you know, and trees and all those natural things. It's an ability that's built in, you know, to get beyond all of these things. So, amen. And if you, if you really, if you are, I'm going to be on tomorrow morning to talk about this. You don't have to watch it that early if you have things to do. But uh, I, I want you to at least come back and look at it. Amen. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at. Uh, scriptures before I move on. What the first one is in the book of Revelation and the 18th chapter. The book of Revelation and the 18th chapter. Revelation chapter 18. And let me just take a break for a minute and share something else. I'd like you, while you're finding Revelation 18, uh, yesterday uh, I, I got a text. Late night I got a text. Um, so that was the night before <coughs> that one of my people that I know, she's not really in church very much, um, but I've known her for quite some time now, and she said she wasn't feeling well, and she thought she might have COVID and wanted to get a COVID test. And so I said, well, I don't know how to do that, but um, let me give you, you know, my doctors. I have two doctors in the area, Dr. Wright and Dr. Nduka. <coughs> that um, <laughs> their offices know me very well. I just call them and tell them I'm calling with somebody. I'm taking somebody. You know, I go there myself once in a while, but I mean, I'm usually taking someone there for something. And so, so when I go there, when I, ca I called um, Dr. Nduka and asked if you know, he could see her or do something, well, says if she's having symptoms of COVID, he really, she really can't come into the office, but they are going to inform the health department so that they can go <coughs> visit with her and do the test. Well, um, for a while I couldn't get, get her yesterday on the phone and so last night at 11.50, 11.49 to be specific, she texted me and said she, she had been having a stroke. So now I've got to call her today and find out what on earth is going on. She lives in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so I got a call and found out. But I wanted to pray for her. Her name's Deb. I wanted to pray for her and, uh, you know, um, lift her up before God. That
that whatever was out of normal yesterday, God has touched and moved, and we prayed, I prayed yesterday for her, <coughs> but continue to pray for her. But that's the kind of thing that's going on in this season. She could have actually, she could have actually died, amen, but for God. And uh, it is interesting, I, 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 get those kind of, I get calls for the food, I get calls for things like I just said. I get calls, you know, for, you know, stuff with taxis. I get calls for stuff with cars. I get calls, or people come with their paperwork. One of my youngsters came a few days ago with paperwork that needed to get done. <coughs> so I get calls, I know, I get calls for the weddings, I get calls for the days, and things like that. But it's so important for us to be ready, ready. But, but the reason for what I just shared was this, that God has built into us an ability these things. <coughs> the hand is in the disease. But uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, and the 18th chapter, I'm going to read 11, verses 11, 12, and 13. It says, And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of, and look at the, the series or the sequence of things. <coughs> no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone and pearls. These are what we consider natural or earthly valuables. Then we go on and cattle and sheep and merchandise of horses and chariots <coughs> and of war and bodies. Or it says in one word, uh, in the in one word, in, in what one version rather, it says slaves. But look at the next part of that. It says and souls of men. So there is a value that God puts on the souls of men. And look at the series of things that He has written there. Um, so the soul of a man is a valuable commodity. Amen. Please note that. In the passage, the list of merchandise commences, as I said, with gold. It commences with silver and ends with the souls of men. Gold and silver, horses, chariots are all natural things, or natural things that we are able to use to barter. We exchange money or goods to get one or the other. Even slaves can be bartered or traded. Historically, we have seen how that has happened. Yet, this is a trading in physical human bodies. Further though, um, we are talking about there is an exchanging of the souls of men as merchandise. My God. <coughs> the souls of men is an interesting concept that God has given us in the book of Revelation. And uh, I'm going to expand or expound on that a little later. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then we'll be in Genesis chapter 2. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the 45th and the 46th verses say this. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And we're talking about Jesus Christ. How be it that is not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Okay? The Lord God uh, in Christ was natural. Then that which is spiritual come. Um, now, I, I want you to consider this. The things that I'm speaking about, these are not the things for babies and baby Christians. Uh, and that's why a five-minute little shot in the, in the arm uh, can't be <laughs> what I use for a, you know, a teaching such as this. There is so much and so much power and so much ability in the Word of God and so much built in to the nature of, of you, your nature and my nature. There's so much built into it that we don't understand. And five minutes or a nice, you know, a nice um, emotionally uplifting um, little talk or, uh, you know, an encouragement or a motivational session. It may help for the moment, but there has to be more than <coughs> a superficial.
superficial understanding of the ability of God that's been built into you. The ability of Christ that's available as potential, that engine, that engine, you know, that six-cylinder engine is greater in power than a four-cylinder. But it's very possible that we are riding around in a car using, using the four-cylinder potential and never taking advantage of the six-cylinder capability. <coughs> and so, you know, there's a term in America, I don't think it's, it's used in Jamaica, but there's a term in America, we are running on all our cylinders, eh? We, are, you know, we, we have even eight cylinders and 12 cylinder cars sometimes, Jaguars, hey, <laughs> wow. You know, we have cars that have even greater power and greater ability you know, uh, NASCAR and you know, some of these racetracks, when they hit that, you know, accelerator, they go, uh, or they tap into tremendous power. Because that has already been built into the capacity of their physical equipment. Well, there is a built in to the capacity of your equipment, tremendous power. But if you don't know, if you don't know, if you don't study it, if you don't understand it, the guy that drives that car on, on a NASCAR circuit, <coughs> if he doesn't understand what he's doing, he'll have an accident. Or he will never apply enough pressure to that accelerator, and he will not have the maneuvering capability um, to, to achieve the greatest potential of that vehicle. And so when you look at yourself in the mirror, or when we consider who we are as the creatures, you know, I mean, at one time I had nice dark hair, and, you know, muscles and youthful, much more youthful appearance, like so many of us, um, but I've aged. But aging is only in the body. The spirit has aged. The soul itself has aged. And that's why people say, you know, I still feel, although my body has this issue, <coughs> although people are ill and don't have the mobility, their mind, and their innermost being, still feels that youthful exuberance. Uh, the emotion, you know, still can be paid. Um, it's the body that is aging. It's the body that Paul says is dying daily, um, both naturally, and um, figuratively, but we, we, we look at it and say, well, well, what is the divine design? And why is it so? And so I just read, I think, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So also it is written, the first Adam became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, howbeit that is not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural than that which is spiritual. So there's something about us <coughs> as creations of Almighty God that we just didn't come out of a little, you know, beaker or a test tube. There was a divine design. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 2 um, and the seventh verse. It says, And Jehovah God formed <laughs> That sounds like a, um, a very, um, again, maybe very superficial or very simplistic in, in, in its definition. But, and Jehovah God, or Elohim, formed, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> so, and Jehovah God formed, so, I want you to think about Plato. <laughs> you know Plato. You know, many of us as kids use Plato. So, and Jehovah God formed man. So he took the, the earth or the clay and he molded it and he formed it into the image of what he wanted. So it says he formed man of the dust of the ground. Uh, somebody said that he, the dust, he, he got some dust, he put it together and then when the man was looking like a man, says he breathed 
into his nostrils the breath of life. It really is the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So, so we see where spirit, we see where soul, and we see where body is mentioned in, in the scriptures. Um, and, uh, but, but we don't necessarily take time to go and do uh, an analysis, to go and do a review, <coughs> to examine it. You know, we go into, uh, when I was in the biology lab as a boy, I remember I was at a school. It was actually it was in Kingston. Um, when I was a boy, as a little kid, um, we we were. We, I was in a school and we had a, a really nice science. It was like with the back then, we had a really nice science lab, <coughs> really well decked out. I, you know, I'm thinking now. I wonder if they still have things like that. But a really nice science lab in the school. And so I remember sitting there. Our teacher, our biology teacher, was, was someone from the United States, as a matter of fact. She was in the Peace Corps, and she was teaching biology. And I remember her you know, taking out, opening the thing, taking out the beakers, and taking out the potassium, and taking out the different chemicals, and, and then showing us how to do different kinds of experiments and so on. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, when you do the experiment, then you can arrive at certain other substances and so on. But, but, but that sometimes, yes, we have determined that if you put this together with that, you know, it can be a catalyst for something. But, but hold on. <coughs> but God was not trying to experiment. He was very specific in the things that he did. See, over the last few years of my life, uh, maybe the last 10 years or so, um, maybe a little bit longer, I, I've had a strong need to give a message about this in a way that people understand the gravity <coughs> of the divine design. It's a message that would both be intricate and profound. Some things I think people may not get it. Um, it will not be easy to share, nor will it necessarily be easy to totally understand. And uh, for this reason, I'm taking my time, and uh, I'm going to take, uh, make great effort in giving uh, <coughs> explanation. But I think I've always felt that this is important. Um, the, the, the scriptures, you know, share with us um, some keys into the divine design. Um, in the natural world, you know, we are constrained sometimes to share only what we know or maybe we parrot what we have heard. But we need to have a personal knowledge that is usable, but first it must be comprehensible. That means that we must understand it and then we must have the ability to apply it or use it. Because if we, if we gain knowledge that the car's engine has this potential, but we never use it, especially in situations where we need greater acceleration <coughs> or we need greater momentum, if we never use it, we lack then the achievement of potential. Um, this message is for your consideration, it's for your concern, and it concerns your spiritual life, the warfare that we are involved in, involved in, in relation to the end of the age, um, what's going on with the coronavirus, <coughs> the mutations that are coming um, on the scene, the, the natural challenges in the earth, the, the understanding of the spiritual person that you are. Uh, let's take a moment and look at, and I'm going to probably end with this today, the, the trilogy, uh, the tripartite, some people say, <coughs> the tripartite or the trilogy of our human design, amen? Trilogy meaning, meaning, meaning in three parts, amen? My tongue is getting ahead of my mind. <coughs> And 
it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground. This refers to the human body. And it says, And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You've got to understand that this describes how God gave spirit to man. It was Adam's spirit. So man's body was formed, your body and mine, historically, <coughs> or empirically, was formed from the, the dust of the ground. That man's spirit was given to him directly. Uh, he is the father of spirits, it says. Dir given directly um, by God from himself. So what is in us is a part of God. that was created came from the earth. But when God breathed into man, um, his spirit, that came from himself. So the spirit that is in us, that is, which is really essentially who we are, is directly from God. And man, it says, became a living soul. You see, my friends, after the breath of life had entered into our nostrils, man began to live. He became a living soul. The spirit, the soul, and the body are three uniquely separate entities. That's the trilogy. The trilogy of the spirit, the soul, and body of mankind. Um, First Thessalonians chapter 5 and the 23rd verse. Let me repeat that. I want you to, don't just listen to me now. I hope you're writing some of this down. I hope you're going to take some time and if you don't write it down now, later on you write it down Go back and look at these scriptures and see if what if what um, Bishop Watson is saying is really so. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, May your spirit and your soul and your body, now this is what's in the Bible, <coughs> if you realize I am not in a lab trying to figure out something. This is clearly stated. May your spirit your soul and your body be preserved entire. Wow. The spirit then is God-given. The soul is a living soul and the body is God-formed. The spirit is God-given. The soul is a living soul and the body is God-formed. Aha. Uh -huh. Wow. According to common understanding, according to what you and I know on a day-to-day -day basis, what that has been shared with us, that we have probably read and studied and heard, the soul um, is our personality. When the spirit and the body were joined, man became, when the spirit and the body were joined, uh, man became a living soul. The characteristics then of angels is a little bit different. <coughs> Angels are, in, in essence, they are spirits. And uh, lower animals, the dogs and the cats, they are beasts of the field, or they are flesh. They are not spirit. So, angels are spirit. Um, animals are flesh. We humans have an interesting combination, of the, however. We have both spirit and we have body. But our character, our nature, our true characteristic is neither spirit nor body, but soul, a combination. We have a living soul, hence the Bible calls man a soul. When Jacob went down into Egypt with his family, the scriptures tell us that all the souls of the house of Jacob that came into Egypt were three score and ten. That's in Genesis chapter 46, and the... 27th verse, again, those who had received Peter's word on Pentecost were baptized and they were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. So, is it really talking about the physical body only? No, 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 no not at all. <coughs> it's talking about the eternal makeup, the, the conversion of the, the totality of God's Hence, soul stands for our personality, 
for what truly makes us who we are. What are the various functions of spirit and soul and body? These, these uh, I will explain later. But, but I, I, was, uh, I, I was really blessed by something that, um, that I found in Andrew, one of Andrew Murray's writings. And let me read it to you, or let me just go through it with you. And uh, I will end with this part of it. We're talking about the, the, the trilogy of man. That is what? Spirit, soul, and body. In the, this is now Andrew Murray speaking. In the history of man's creation, we have read, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Thus was his body made and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life. Thus his spirit came from God. And man became a living soul. The spirit <coughs> quickening the body made man a living soul, a living person with the consciousness of himself. The soul was the meeting place, the point of the union between the body and the spirit. Through the body, man, the living soul, stood related to the external world of sense. The body touches the rest of creation. Through the body, we could influence it or be influenced by it. Heat and cold. Through the spirit, he stood, that is, man stood related to the spirit world and the spirit of God from which we came. And we could be the recipient then and the minister of the life and the power of God's own spirit. Why? Because he put his own spirit by divine design into us. So standing like that, we stand between two worlds. We belong to both worlds. We belong to the physical world, and yet we also belong to the spirit world. And the union, the soul, the union, the link between the two, the control, uh, the, the commanding force of the two sides of us is that soul side. The soul had the power of self-determination of choosing or refusing the objects by which he was surrounded. So the, the, the soul has the ability to, to, to let the spirit command or to influence the spirit. The, 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 the soul has the ability to let the flesh command or to influence the flesh. We have the ability to choose or refuse the objects which surrounds us and to which we stood in it fellowship or relationship. In the constitution, my friends, of these three parts of man's nature, the spirit as linking him with the divine was the highest. You know, the, the, the Bible tells us that the spirit of man <coughs> is the candle of the Lord. It is that which God has put on the inside of us. It links us to the divine. It is the highest connection of our tripartite or trilogy of being. The body connecting, connecting him with the sensible and the, the carnal or the natural world. And then the, the lowest portion is what the soul, the intermediary, the, the balancer, amen? <laughs> partaker of the nature of what? Of flesh and partaker of the nature of spirit. But there's a bond that unites spirit and body, and that bond works through that soul. Its work, as the, its work is as the central power. It was to maintain them in their true relation, because you don't want your flesh to control you. Amen? You don't want your spirit man to lose the ability in God to have the control over the situations of life or thought processes and to keep us in divine check and in divine order. It's work then, as I said, it's the central force, the central power, and it maintains us in proper relationship with each other. When I say us, I'm talking about our what? Our spirit and our body in proper relation to each other. It allows us to be balanced in our life. 
people that are addicted, for example, are out of balance. People that are super spiritual are out of balance. <clears throat> to keep the body, when I say super spiritual, I mean that, you know, they are really not working in the sense of God, but they are in tune with deception and, and other things in their lives. Now, now, when we look at this, we keep things subject by the what? By the soul. The soul itself is to receive through the spirit as the higher. From the divine spirit we receive what is necessary to keep us. <clears throat> we receive perfection and so it passes it down to the body. That by which it might be partaker of the divine spirit perfection. So the nature of man is to hear and to see through our soul what comes from the spirit. <coughs> Many times you'll hear yourself, for example, yourself singing or you hear someone speaking on the inside of you and then all of a sudden it is your mind, your, your soul, your soul picks it up and communicates it to your physical body. Your soul picks it up in the wavelength of God and begins to do the commanding influence through your physical body because your body then has, has the touch, the influence capacity for the world around you. What then is the spirit? It's that which makes us conscious of God and relates us to the divine spirit. What is the soul? It is that which relates us to ourselves and gives us self-consciousness. What is the body? It causes us to be related to the world around us. Schofield, <coughs> and many of you may know about Schofield's reference Bible, C.I. Schofield. In his Bible he says that the spirit gives God consciousness. And I think this is a good time a good statement to end in. It says, C.I. Schofield in his Bible <coughs> says this, in his um, reference, he says, the spirit gives God consciousness. The soul gives self-consciousness. And the body gives world consciousness. Let me repeat that. The what? The spirit gives God consciousness. The soul gives self-consciousness and the body gives us world consciousness. Interesting. Mighty God. Told you it's going to be a little deep here today. And so, let's continue this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. I know, I think today is, today is the 23rd, tomorrow is the 24th. We'll talk about it tomorrow and uh, continue with this. But I want you, for me to talk about this, go back and look at the scriptures I've said, or re re redo this, watch it. I want you to share it with somebody. Share it out there in a group, share it out there with someone, share it out there, you know, on, um, you know, on one of the platforms. Yeah, and uh, because this is important. This is important. It is important, as Schofield said, the spirit gives us a God consciousness. It is that side of us that connects with God. Our flesh doesn't connect with God. <coughs> Even our emotions, our soul doesn't connect with God. It is the spirit of man that connects with God. So the spirit of man um, gives us the consciousness of God. Amen? And then the, the soul of man gives us a self-awareness. The decision-making. The sense of who we are and where we are going and how we're going to act and what we're going to do. The emotional side of us, the feelings and uh, the touchy-touchy and things like that. Not touchy-touchy in the sense of physical, but in the sense of our emotions. And then finally the body, which gives us the world consciousness, the touch and the feel of the world around us. The ability to engage the natural things around us and to deal with them. We have divine design and we need to understand it. going into 2021 
we can't live with the ignorance that we were born with in 2020. So let's move into something greater, something fresh, because this truly is an end time message to prepare end time warriors to defeat the ignorance of the church. Amen? God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. And don't forget, if you are so inclined, God leads you. But don't forget, this is a time of year where we could use your help. And uh, anything from using Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, you know, however it is, uh, Western Union, I think, is still available. And the, the various other options, even transfers. <coughs> There's um, one friend of ours that actually transfers locally. Um, offerings into our account. So I can send those account numbers to you if um, that's how you'd like to do it. Or, or you can do you know, electronic transfers which sometimes are just a little bit too expensive. But you can do an electronic transfer to our uh, ministry accounts here in Jamaica. We really appreciate you. We thank you for all you do and all you have done. And again, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a blessing to so many for Christmas dinner and for our children with their Christmas gifts. Amen. God bless you. And we pray your protection in the name of Jesus Christ. Master. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God.